Hi, my name is Vince and welcome to my YouTube channel and to this video, the second part of the story of my hi-fi journey. This is a true story of how my wife Linda and I put together an AV system in the mid-1980s using mainly Den and hi-fi components. You may have already seen the video I made in which we put together a Pioneer stack system coupled with a small TV at the beginning of the 80s to replace the concoction of disparate sound systems I'd used before. If not, why not go there now? I'll add a link in the description below. Or you may want to watch it later. In that video, I concluded that although we really liked the performance of the Pioneer system, it wasn't fully balanced with the small 14-inch portable colour TV we had at the time. We decided that the TV experience, at which for much of our use, would perform so much better if the associated sound came from the speakers in the bigger stereo system right next to it. So we set about creating an AV system. Now, at this time, it was a novel experience for us, as we had not known anyone else creating this kind of setup. As far as we were aware, we had invented the AV system, although we never referred to it as such. We decided a full overhaul was needed to enable a match between the TV unit and the hi-fi setup, so we went about looking to find compatible components. So found ourselves, for the first time, auditioning various components, setups and systems in the product test sound rooms of our local hi-fi dealers. In the end, we chose to match some Denon components with a Panasonic TV. We had created our first AV system. It comprised a Panasonic TV primarily Denon Hi-Fi components, boasting a total of 400 watts of amplification with an added centerpiece, a J.A. Michel record deck. But for sound output, we retained our beloved Pioneer speakers. In the test sound rooms, we had compared Denon equipment to alternatives from the likes of NAD, Technics and Marantz, but favoured the classic warm English sound of the Denon. It provided a linear improvement on the Pioneer setup without introducing the sterile clipped sound typical of systems like the NAD. Plus, Denon had a good range of compatible components. And most importantly to us, they looked great. We didn't like the prospect of putting together a mix and match of varied components from different manufacturers, as our tests had shown that mixing makes meant the results could vary and could sometimes work against each other. Additionally, as we could afford to upgrade the whole system in one go, we could obtain ourselves a neat, modern, updated, matching brand look. The silver with black Pioneer style, which we were replacing, had become a bit dated by then, with many systems at the time, including Pioneer, moving to the simple, plain black look. In the mid-1980s, televisions were still modestly sized CRT 4x3 displays. However, a new style was emerging. FST, or flat screen technology, was the latest innovation to flatten the curvature of TV tubes, which were becoming more obviously convex as the screen sizes grew. And we saw one which exaggerated its flatter tube face by adding another complementary actual flat glass panel in front. It was a 22-inch Panasonic model, and we chose it for it at the time, generous 500mm screen size, the recognised brand, observed picture performance, apparent quality, suitable connectivity, and most importantly, the great modern FST system matching looks. And for the first time, we decided to purchase some quality accessory interconnects to attach the TV output sound to the amplifier, rather than rely on the cheaply produced supplied connectors. We kept the Pioneer speakers in the system because we had been so pleased with their sound range, which bettered many newer and more expensive specialist speaker manufacturers in performance. We selected a powerful pre-main integrated amplifier as the core of our system, which actually fed output to a four-channel configuration designed to provide a parallel second stereo output. With this secondary facility, we were able to channel the amplified sound into our adjacent bedroom, where we had located our NEC portable colour TV. We then purchased a pair of sturdy bookshelf speakers from Mission Electronics to use in the bedroom alongside the TV, and ran a set of cables from our lounge into the bedroom to drive them. We were particularly pleased to discover a fantastic looking highly rated turntable, the Michel Focus One. We were impressed, not just for its looks in the system, but performance as well, 
with a very lightly sprung base and consequent stable platform. We also learnt from the first time that on high-end audio decks, after you buy the actual turntable, you need to separately choose and purchase a tone arm and cartridge. And further, the cartridge pickup needles came in two types, moving magnet or moving coil, with a lighter touch, more precise moving coil units providing greater performance at the usual cost of more price. No prizes for guessing which type we selected. We added a CD player to the system, which was a relatively new, so therefore expensive, sound technology at the time. A Philips CD-304. It was our first experience of being an early adopter to a new technology and being a victim of the cost you have to endure for having the latest thing. Such customers tend to help financially offset emerging technologies prior to when the future mass production techniques can be developed to reduce costs for all the others. We also added a video cassette recorder into the system. For this we chose the latest high-end hi-fi model with Nikam stereo and S-video output because at the time I owned a top-end camcorder, a stunning Sony Hi8 model, and I wanted equally high performance quality tape transfer. The Denon cassette deck we selected gave us new dull PC processing for improved noise reduction which outperformed the hiss suppression of our previous Dolby B equipped Pioneer deck quite measurably. Note that we decided to drop the graphic equaliser component. In our sound test we had discovered that as system components became more expensive and upmarket, less use is needed for tonal manipulation. In fact, in use we generally play the amp flat without even adjusting the included bass and treble controls. In case you don't realise, particularly before digital sound manipulation, most component tone controls were a bit of a sleight of hand. Really top-end stuff dispensed with them altogether. All tone controls and graphic equalisers could really do was deduct other frequencies whilst lifting the overall volume to compensate. They can't actually add something to any particular chosen frequency. If they could truly add power output, then manufacturers would already boast of this increased performance as part of the original stated design. Notwithstanding that, the overall sound of the completed system noticeably exceeded that of the already good Pioneer setup. In particular, the system provided us with better all-round clarity and a fuller sound and overall bass, so the Denon system was very satisfying to use. In fact, we noticed that our new higher quality components actually started to highlight any poorly produced records of cassettes that we owned, particularly when compared to the new precision of the digital CD player. However, any good quality, well-produced LP record or carefully curated metal tape recording actually showed up the limitations of digitally limited 44 kHz CD processing. We noticed our new quality analog record deck really performed well with cleanly pressed LPs producing a crisp control with a wide lustrous sound. Apart from my poor 1975 single recording of 10cc's I'm Not In Love, which suffered badly from a misaligned central hole punch and subsequent wailed, whined, strained and groaned its way through the track. We'd started to really appreciate that a good quality sound experience was not just an ability to be, to be louder, but was much more about detailing, particularly at lower sound levels, whilst also providing minimal distortion as volumes increased. At heart, our setup was still just a stereo system comprised of various components plus a TV as input sources, but it paved the way for us to continue seeking good television reproduction sound for taped movies and over-air programming. In particular, listen to standard common broadcast TV soaps using a 100 watt per channel amplifier was a delightful new experience, showing that regular analog TV broadcasts were actually far more detailed and complex than we had previously known. The bedroom 14 inch TV setup now sounded great, if not a bit audio skewed, using the hi fi rated bookshelf speakers driven off an amp putting out 200 watts. The bigger limitation was that it was always a pain to get out of bed to go to the living room to turn off the system late at night. So we often just simply listened to the hardly adequate, tiny, inbuilt speaker, unless we were watching something special. We moved to a new house in 1986 and naturally took the whole system with us. But our bedrooms were now upstairs so we decided not to try to connect the speakers there. Instead we utilised the speaker cable that we had to connect our mission bookshelf speakers 
as a rear parallel stereo system in our lounge, effectively creating a crude potential total 400 watt dual stereo surround sound system. Not only had we created an AV system, but now a surround sound one as well. The twin stereo system in one room did work, but the front and rears would be slightly out of sync due to the differing cable lengths. So we purchased some more cabling of equal length for both the front and rear channels. This effectively meant an excess of front speaker cable length that had to be carefully looped on the floor behind the speakers. When listening to just music, we tended to just activate the single front channel pair only because stereo produced music felt far more natural coming from ahead rather than when being engrossed inside a double stereo sound. This is because one tends to imagine looking towards sound only performance rather than being sat in the middle of them. For films though, the quad speaker immersive surround effect was most enjoyable. We did notice another phenomenon, which was that our power amps gave off a great deal of heat when the sound was cranked up, which was physically felt in the room. After all, the 0.4 kilowatt output had to disperse somewhere. We also noticed that we started to receive comments from visiting friends and family that the system was making our living room look a bit like a hi-fi shop. But we liked the technical slant ourselves and liked being in hi-fi shops. Plus we knew and really appreciated that it was providing us with a high quality setup. Anyway, you'd probably like to know how much this would all cost us. So let me set it all out for you. I compiled this data based on my own memory on what we spent, or records, or what we paid for some items, alongside some recent internet research. The task was made simpler by the fact that everything we had purchased was purchased from new. We also converted these mid 1980s spend values to their equivalents in 2021, using the Bank of England's CPI inflation calculator, just so you can get an idea from today's vantage point. This is despite CPI rates being a bit disingenuous as a true measure of hi-fi component inflation. First up, the TV. I can't recall the designation of the now rare Panasonic model, which may have been a TC-C22 or TXC221R, costing us about £120 in the mid-1980s, an equivalent of about £320 today. The pre-main amplifier was the Denon PMA757, which output a total of 400 watts. And if it made now, it would cost us about 1320 The matching tuner also came from Denon, the TU747L, a seemingly overpriced three-band item, costing around £120 at the time. The cassette deck was the Denon DRM33, and it cost us about £300, or £790 today. But it did have Dolby C noise reduction, a beautifully damped door mechanism, and bright blue LEDs. Our CD player was the aforementioned Philips CD304, which cost as much as our main amplifier. Imagine today paying out £1,320 for a CD player with basic functions. Mind you, it was the only one we ever had with a metal slide-out CD tray, so that's something. The record deck was a J.A. Michel Focus One model, which looked like a designer artefact, cost us £400, and didn't include a tone arm or pickup cartridge. The tone arm itself was a mission accessory but the separately required cartridge was an Autophon MC10 moving coil unit, which cost us about £80. The overshiny video cassette was a high-end model from JVC, the HRD725, and featured a drop-down panel exposing even more buttons and cost us about £500, another £1,320 at today's prices, reflecting the latest CD quality audio performance, low tape hiss, hi-fi embedded sound and AFM technology but still a standard 625 line VHS power picture. We already had our beloved Pioneer speakers, which could reproduce bass levels down to a subwoofer competitive level of 38 hertz. So we reused them in the new setup. But the 1981 price is shown here, so I can show a total paid for the system value at the end. We separately purchased a nice pair of over-ear Pioneer SE 450 wired headphones to listen in peace occasionally, but also so I could clearly monitor my video editing processes. Finally, a small extra is included for the initial interconnects we purchased to connect the TV. All this gave us a total main system value of £2,880, equivalent to paying about £7,740 today. However, as we had already upgraded the speakers, our actual upgrade spend was nearer £2,580. So in all, we had spent over £2,500, or about 40% of our joint annual take-home pay at the time, on upgrading our system from a good quality single manufacturer stack system to a full-featured curated 
dual stereo AV system, which is equivalent to spending near to £7,750 today. Note that I haven't included prices of the bedroom setup here, that is the mission speakers, which were then moved to create the rudimentary surround sound system in our new lounge, along with their associated cabling. This would all add around £300 to the spend at the time, or about another £790 today. And it all looked and sounded really worth it. And it would be an above average, good quality and capable system even today. However, no matter how lovely our new system was, we knew that in time some elements would eventually be technically superseded and that time came around when multi-channel true digital surround sound equipment and content became available. And you'll have to subscribe to my channel so you don't miss out how we moved in that direction with our next updates into the 1990s. For now, thank you very much for watching this far and for adding that like you're just about to press. This has been a Vince Unlimited production written and presented by me using photographs for my own collection. I note that all unknown values were best estimates, and I'm confident to call this a film by Vince, copyright 2022. And finally, feel free to add a comment below on your own experiences with 1980s hi-fi curation, and whether you were also creating rudimentary AV and analog surround sound setups before the manufacturers came up with their own dedicated digital versions in the 90s.